Hi, thank you so much for joining me today for a preview of the new Dog Genetics Lab from MiniPCR Bio. My name is Allison, and I'm really excited to share this soon to be released lab with you. Mostly because I really, really like dogs. And also, I like genetics a lot too. MiniPCR's overarching goal is to make biotechnology more accessible. We make biotech equipment that's used by students in classrooms by scientists in the field, and even by astronauts on the International Space Station. The other side of our work is that we offer innovative lab activities to give students real hands-on experience with biotechnology. Today, I'll share a sneak peek of our new dog genetics lab. During the webinar, I will demo this gel electrophoresis lab and we will discuss why dogs provide an engaging way to cover the relationship between genotype and phenotype. As you know, dogs display an incredible amount of physical diversity. There are tiny dogs like Chihuahuas and giant dogs like Great Danes. There are dogs with long fur like this bearded collie and dogs with no fur like this Sholo the type of dog that was in the movie Coco. Because humans have been breeding dogs for centuries to select for traits that we wanted, there are dogs of every shape and size, dogs with fur of every color and pattern. Today, we will focus on one specific physical trait in dogs, furnishings. Furnishings is a term that refers to a pattern of longer facial hair in dogs. Dogs with furnishings have longer fur on the muzzle that makes them look like they have a mustache, which you can see in this picture. Dogs with furnishings also have bushy eyebrows. I want to slip in one quick genetics vocab term here. Furnishings is an example of a phenotype, an observable trait in an organism that is due in, at least in part to genetics. Furnishings probably isn't one of the phenotypes that jumps to mind when you think about dogs, but it's probably something you'll notice all the time now that you know about it. You might be asking yourself, why study furnishings? First of all, it's a cute phenotype. But in all seriousness, it's the perfect phenotype to use for an introduction to genetics. This is because scientists recently determined that a single gene determines whether dogs will have furnishings. Many phenotypes, like coat color, are determined by complex genetic interactions between multiple genes, but furnishings is an example of a phenotype that's easy to identify just by looking at a dog that we know is inherited following simple Mendelian genetics. Some dog breeds have furnishings and others do not. Let's see some examples, because who doesn't love dog photos? There are a lot of examples of dog breeds that don't have furnishings. You'll notice that while some of these dogs have short fur and others long fur, one thing that they all have in common is a lack of furnishings. These dogs do not have mustaches or bushy eyebrows. Now we'll highlight a specific breed that lacks furnishings. Labrador retrievers never have furnishings. Here we have three gorgeous Labradors of Instagram, Bailey, Doris, and Bo. And you can see that none of these Labradors have bushy eyebrows or a mustache. As a contrast, here are some dogs where the presence of furnishings is obvious. Again, some of these dogs have long fur and others have short fur, but they all have visible furnishings, a clear mustache and bushy eyebrows. Something that you might not have considered is that because people sometimes groom dogs, you aren't always seeing what their coats naturally look like. An excellent example of this is the poodle. While a dog that looks like this might come to mind when you think of a poodle, poodles can look surprisingly different based on how they've been groomed. Poodles have long curly fur all over their bodies, and depending on how their coats have been clipped, they can look like almost an entirely different dog. Here's a poodle that's been groomed differently, where the fur on its body has been clipped short, but the hair on its ears has be been left longer. This is a common grooming style for poodles. It's convenient to clip the fur on the muzzle short, but it hides the fact that all poodles have furnishings. Let's see some examples of poodles where the fur on their face hasn't been clipped short and we can observe their furnishings. 
Here we have three absolutely adorable poodles of Instagram, Brooklyn, Willie, and Hazel. And you can clearly see that all of these poodles have longer fur around their muzzles that makes it look like they have a cute mustache. So we have seen that Labradors lack furnishings and poodles have furnishings. If you breed a Labrador and a poodle, you get a Labradoodle. And these dogs have furnishings. Here we have three Labradoodles whose parents were a Labrador and a poodle. Mia, Macy, and Chase. And we can see that they all have cute mustaches and bushy eyebrows. The fact that these dogs have furnishings tells us that the trait is dominant. We'll talk more about the genetic basis of this soon, but I just wanted to plant this idea in your heads early on. In this lab, we will track the inheritance of furnishings in a litter of puppies by testing their DNA. This will allow us to cover a lot of ground in terms of basic genetics and is a nice example of the relationship between genotype and phenotype. We will use a technique called gel electrophoresis to test the puppy's DNA. And because it takes approximately 20 minutes to get the experimental results, I need to set the lab up now at the start of the webinar. I know it's a little weird since I haven't told you anything other than that we're doing a genetic test, but I promise we'll get to that soon. I also promise that I will explain how gel electrophoresis works just after I get the experiment going. Before I start the gel, I want to mention that this lab has a storyline. You're thinking about breeding your Labradoodle Molly, so you take her to meet two potential mates, Zeus the Poodle and Otto the Labradoodle. You decide to take some time to pick a suitable match, but it turns out that Molly has an opinion on the matter and she surprises you with a litter of puppies. After testing the puppy's DNA to track the inheritance of furnishings, you will be able to use genetics to determine whether Zeus or Otto is the father of Molly's puppies. If you're suddenly feeling intimidated that this lab uses gel electrophoresis, don't be. Mini-PCR has lots of free resources to help you bring gel electrophoresis to your classroom, including videos and student worksheets explaining gel electrophoresis and micropipetting. Plus, I'm about to show you how easy it is to run a gel. So let's load the gel. Just give me a second to switch my camera. So now you are looking at uh, a phone camera view of my gel electrophoresis setup. You can see that there is a rectangular kind of opaque thing in here. That's the gel. And right now it's submerged in liquid buffer. All we need to do is load our samples into the gel. So it is actually very easy. My best pro tips would be, even if you're an experienced pipetter like me, I always brace the pipette with my other hand, which allows me to guide the pipette tip into these little indentations in the gel where we're going to load our DNA samples. You don't have to get the pipette tip way into these little pockets. It just needs to be a little bit into the pocket and then you eject your sample. You'll notice right now that the samples I'm putting in here are blue in color. That is because they have a dye mixed in them that has several beneficial purposes. One, it just helps you to see where your samples are going. So I can tell that I've successfully loaded my sample into the well. Another thing that's helpful about it is that the dye has a higher density than the buffer, so it helps your samples sink into the wells. So you can see I'm going at a pretty good pace here. Just have a few more samples. Loading a gel is a skill that takes a little bit of practice, but there are a lot of different ways you can help your students master this technique. For example, we have s reusable silicone gels that are basically indestructible that you can have students practice loading over and over again. Before I had access to those, I would actually save my gels after they'd been run 
in like a giant mason jar and then I would re-melt them and my students would practice loading samples onto those. You can't run a DNA sample on a, a re-melted gel, but you can use them to just practice loading. So that's it. I've loaded all my samples. All I need to do is put the lid on this thing and then press the power button. That green light tells me it's running. So in about 20 minutes, we'll come back and take a look at it. So let me come back here. Now that the gel's running, let's re regroup. So far, we've talked about the furnishing's phenotype. Now we'll move on to discuss how a dog's DNA determines whether they will have furnishings. DNA is a code made of four bases, A, T, C, and G. I think of DNA as containing the instructions for life. This is because the information encoded in DNA determines how an organism develops and functions. This means that DNA also determines many of an organism's physical characteristics. When you think of DNA, you probably think of genes. While it's actually a little complicated to give a simple definition of a gene, for our purposes, we can think of a gene as a section of DNA that carries the instructions for making a specific protein. The instructions are written using the four DNA bases. Because proteins carry out most of the functions in an organism, altering how proteins are made by altering the bases in the gene can change the organism. We won't be focusing on this in today's webinar, but I highly recommend that you check out our previous mini PCR webinar on the central dogma, which does an excellent job covering this topic. I will say right up front that in today's lab, we'll be tracking the inheritance of a specific gene, but we won't get into the function of the protein that it encodes because we just don't have time. But if you want to know more about this, there will be some references at the end of the presentation to point you in the right direction to learn more. If you compare the same location in the genome between two different dogs, that is, the same location on the same chromosome, all dogs will have the same gene there. So if you looked at the same location on chromosome 13 in two different dogs here, dog A and dog B, they will have the same gene there. But they might have a different version of that gene, and scientists call these alleles. Different alleles for the same gene vary in their DNA sequence. Sometimes alleles of a gene vary by a single DNA base, while other times alleles vary by many DNA bases, for example, due to insertions or deletions. The gene we will focus on today related to the furnishings phenotype is called RSPO2, and there are two alleles. Instead of showing the DNA sequence, I'm going to illustrate the RSPO2 gene as a block because it makes it easier to visually compare the alleles. Here we can see one allele of the RSPO2 gene. And we compare it with the other allele, we can see that the second allele is longer due to an insertion of an extra 167 base pairs near the end of the gene. Before, we were looking at a single chromosome in a dog. But like humans, dogs have two copies of each chromosome one inherited from their mother and one inherited from their father. This means that dogs have two copies of each gene, which brings us to the term genotype. A genotype is a broad term for an organism's genetic makeup. In terms of today's lab, we will be talking about a dog's genotype for a single gene. When we say we want to know what a dog's RSPO2 genotype is, we mean the combination of alleles that a dog has for the RSPO2 gene. The alleles that a dog inherited from their mother and father could be the same. Like in this example, you can see the two copies of the RSPO2 allele are the same, but they could also be different. Like in this example, where you can see that the dog has inherited one copy of each RSPO2 allele. Now to tie all this background information together. Remember, this lab focuses on a specific physical trait or phenotype in dogs, which is whether they have furnishings or not. Looking at furnishings is a great way to introduce genetics because the phenotype is controlled by a single gene, RSPO2. To put this another way, a dog's RSPO2 genotype determines their furnishings phenotype. <laughs> 
I already told you there are two RSpO2 alleles, but before I referred to them as allele 1 and allele 2. Now I want you to know that one allele is recessive and the other dominant. For alleles with a dominant recessive relationship, having one copy of the dominant allele is sufficient to give the dominant phenotype, which we already established is having furnishings. The shorter version of the RSpO2 gene is the recessive allele, while the longer version is the dominant allele. Before we move on, I want to point out that sometimes scientists will use a one-letter abbreviation for alleles. While there isn't a single way to choose the letter, a common practice is to, is to use a letter that refers to the trait. So in this presentation, we will use the letter F to refer to the RSpO2 alleles, F for furnishings. We will also follow the convention of using a lowercase f to denote the recessive allele and an uppercase f to denote the dominant allele. One last note before we move on, I just can't help myself. I'm going to take 30 seconds to tell you why I think it is so cool that we know that the RSpO2 gene controls furnishings. It is not easy to link specific genes to specific traits. It's one thing to know that a trait is heritable, or even to know that a trait is likely controlled by a single gene. But it is incredibly difficult to determine the specific location and sequence of DNA that determines that particular trait within the entire genome. Luckily, technical advances like faster and less expensive DNA sequencing and powerful computer algorithms are making it a little easier, and now scientists are identifying genes that control all sorts of phenotypes in dogs. If, like me, you love dogs and you love genetics, there's a lot of really interesting research going on right now. Thanks for sticking with me through that. Now, let's put the information about the RSpO2 genotype and the furnishings phenotype together visually. There are two different alleles for the RSpO2 gene in dogs, which gives three possible combinations of alleles or genotypes. A dog could have two copies of the recessive RSpO2 allele, making their genotype homozygous recessive and their phenotype a lack of furnishings. A dog could have two copies of the dominant RSpO2 allele, making their genotype homozygous dominant and their phenotype presence of furnishings. And finally, a dog could have one copy of the dominant RSpO2 allele and one copy of the recessive RSpO2 allele, making their genotype heterozygous. Because having furnishings is dominant and you only need one copy of the dominant allele to get the dominant phenotype, these dogs will have furnishings. Let's think back to the two dog breeds we looked at earlier, Labradors and Poodles. Keep in mind that having furnishings is the dominant phenotype. Because Labradors lack furnishings, we can infer that they have two copies of the recessive allele. That's the only way their phenotype could be a lack of furnishings. Moving on to Poodles. They have furnishings. Theoretically, Poodles could have one or two copies of the dominant allele and have furnishings, but there's something else we need to consider here which is that for many domesticated dog breeds, artificial selection by humans has led to desired traits becoming fixed in the population. When you breed a poodle with another poodle, all of the resulting poodle puppies will have furnishings. For that to be the case, the parents have to be homozygous for the dominant allele. Let's use a Punnett square to show why this is the case. While we're doing this, we'll do a quick review of what Punnett squares are used for. Punnett squares are diagrams that allow you to visualize the genotypes that could result from mating between two individuals. Recall that dogs, like people, have two copies of each gene, one copy that was inherited from their biological mother and one copy that was inherited from their biological father. If we have a dog whose RSpO2 genotype is heterozygous, when they mate, they will randomly pass on either the dominant allele or the recessive allele to each offspring. We diagram this by separating the two alleles over a grid. The other side of the grid is for the other parent. In this example, the other parent's genotype is also heterozygous. The grid is a nice way for us to work out the combinations of alleles, that is genotypes, that we could see from the th in the theoretical offspring of these two dogs. 
Each square represents a possible puppy genotype based on which allele they inherit from each parent. You can fill these out in any order, but I always work from the top left square. A puppy that inherited the dominant allele from parent 1 and the dominant allele from parent 2 would have a homozygous dominant genotype. Moving down a square, we bring the dominant allele down from parent 1 and the recessive allele over from parent 2, giving a heterozygous genotype. For the top right square, we have the recessive allele from parent 1 and the dominant allele from parent 2, also giving a heterozygous genotype. And for the last square, we bring the recessive allele down from parent 1 and another recessive allele over from parent 2 to give the homozygous recessive genotype. The most important thing to remember is that Punnett squares are predictions. The results tell you what you would expect based on probability, not what you're guaranteed to see in real life. From this square, we can see that one quarter of the puppies born to this, these parents are expected to be homozygous dominant, one half are expected to be heterozygous, and one quarter homo homozygous recessive. But just like how it's possible to flip a coin 10 times in a row and have it land heads up every time, it's possible, although unlikely, for these two dogs to have 10 puppies who all had a homozygous recessive genotype. To get back to the question we were trying to answer, why does this show that poodles have to be homozygous dominant for the RSPO2 gene? Because if some poodles had furnishings because they were heterozygous, when two heterozygous poodles mated, like in this Punnett square, you would get some puppies that were homozygous recessive and lacked furnishings. But this is not what we see in poodles. And in fact, for most dog breeds, artificial selection by humans has led to some traits characteristic of the breed being true breeding. A trait is true breeding when you have two parents with the trait and all of their offspring also have the trait. Like if you breed two poodles, the parents have furnishings, and then all of their offspring also have furnishings. If you think about this at the genetic level, true breeding traits are maintained homozygous. If all poodles have two copies of the dominant allele, then when you breed any two poodles, all of the offspring will also have furnishings. To be clear, not all traits are true breeding in purebred dogs. For example, poodles come in many different colors, so fur color is not true breeding in poodles. But there are many traits that are characteristic of a given dog breed. Think the traits that make a poodle look like a poodle, and these tend to be true breeding within that breed. A few examples of true breeding traits in poodles would be the presence of furnishings, as well as the fact that they always have long and curly fur. So to come back to this visual, poodles are homozygous dominant for the RSPO2 gene. Why have we been talking so much about Labradors and poodles? Because the mother in this lab, Molly, is a Labradoodle. Labradoodle is a broad term for dogs that are part Labrador and part poodle. Initially, Labradoodles were bred to combine favorable traits from both breeds. Labradors tend to make excellent service dogs, while poodles have non-shedding coats that tend to be better for people with allergies. The important thing to know is there are a lot of ways to get a dog that's called a Labradoodle. The first is the most obvious. If you breed a Labrador and a poodle, then you will get puppies that are Labradoodles. Another common combination is to breed a Labradoodle to a poodle. The resulting puppies are also called Labradoodles although genetically they're more poodle than Labrador. If you breed two Labradoodles, the resulting puppies will also be called Labradoodles. Dog breeders have a special naming system that they use to specify these differences in parentage and can also have some pretty strong opinions about how you should breed Labradoodles, but that's not really important for our purposes. I just wanted to bring this up so you know that it's important that we know more about Molly other than the sh that she is a Labradoodle we need to know what kind of Labradoodle Molly is. I know that was a lot of information, but don't forget why we're talking about dog genetics in the first place. We want to figure out the father of Molly's puppies. We know that Molly is the mother, and that either Zeus or Otto is the father. We're going to use the RSPO2 gene to determine paternity, 
We will compare the RSPO2 genotypes of Molly, Zeus, and Otto with the genotypes of Molly's puppies. Based on the genotypes of the puppies, we can use probability to determine if Zeus or Otto is the more likely father of Molly's puppies. So let's take what we've learned so far to figure out some information about Molly. We know that Molly's parents were a Labrador and a Poodle. And we know that Labradors are homozygous recessive for the RSPO2 allele, while Poodles are homozygous dominant for the RSPO2 allele. By filling out the Punnett square that predicts the genotypes of the puppies resulting from this cross, we can see that Molly's genotype is heterozygous. So going back to this visual representation, we know Molly is heterozygous for the RSPO2 gene. What about the potential fathers? We know that Zeus is a poodle, and just a few minutes ago, we came to the conclusion that poodles are homozygous dominant for the RSPO2 gene. Last up is Otto. Like Molly, Otto's parents were a poodle and a Labrador. We can infer that like Molly, Otto is heterozygous for the RSPO2 gene. Now that we have established Molly's genotype, as well as the genotypes of the potential fathers, Zeus and Otto, we can use Punnett squares to predict the genotypes of the puppies if Zeus versus Otto is the father. Starting with Zeus, we know Zeus is a poodle, so his genotype is homozygous dominant. Filling out the Punnett square, we can see the predicted ratio of genotypes for puppies where Molly is the mother and Zeus is the father. It's important to remember that these are just predicted genotypes, but based on probability, we predict that half of Molly and Zeus's puppies will be homozygous dominant and half will be heterozygous. In terms of the puppies' phenotypes, we know for sure that 100% of puppies born to Molly and Zeus would have furnishings. Now let's assume Otto is the father. We know Otto is a heterozygous Labradoodle. Filling out the Punnett square, we can see the predicted ratio of genotypes for puppies where Molly is the mother and Otto is the father. Based on probability, we predict that a quarter of Molly and Otto's puppies would be homozygous dominant, half to be heterozygous, and the last quarter to be homozygous recessive. In terms of the puppy's phenotypes, based on probability, we would predict 75% of Molly and Otto's puppies to have furnishings and 25% to lack furnishings. So looking at these two Punnett squares side by side, I can see one dead giveaway that would tell us for sure that one dog was the father. Do you see it? If any of the puppies are homozygous recessive for the RSPO2 gene, then we know that Otto has to be the father. This is because for a puppy to have two copies of the recessive allele, they need to have inherited one copy from each parent. Zeus only has the dominant allele, so he could not be the father of a homozygous recessive puppy. But what if the puppies are all either homozygous dominant or heterozygous? If that's the case, can we say for sure who the father is? No, but we could say which dog was more likely to be the father based on probability by comparing the observed genotypic ratios to the predicted genotypic ratios, which are different for the two fathers. With this in mind, let's take a minute to meet Molly's puppies. We have Astro, Buster, Chewy, Daisy, Elsa, Flora, Ginger, and Hugo. Eight bundles of cuteness. It's a little difficult to see since Molly's puppies have black fur, but when puppies are young, their fur is short. This means that you can't tell if a puppy will have furnishings until they get a little older, and their fur has a chance to grow longer, if it's going to. But remember, we're doing a genetic test to determine each puppy's RSPO2 genotype, which means that we will be able to predict whether they will have furnishings or not before they even grow in. This lab focuses on results, and the only procedure you need to do is gel electrophoresis, which you saw me start at the beginning of the webinar. But the electrophoresis is the last step in an experimental chain, so I want to tell you what comes first.
broadly, genetic testing that uses gel electrophoresis as the readout happens in three steps. First, DNA is extracted from a biological sample, like blood or fur or a cheek swab. But dogs have a lot of DNA, more than 2.3 billion base pairs. So finding just the DNA that we want to analyze is like searching for a needle in a haystack. Luckily, a powerful tool called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, allows scientists to make billions of copies of just the DNA that they want to study. In our case, that's the RSPO2 gene. Once we have copied the RSPO2 DNA, we can use gel electrophoresis to determine the dog's genotype. This lab, again, focus on, focuses on the results of this three-step process. Steps one and two were already done, and you saw me start step three, the gel electrophoresis, at the start of the webinar. When I added the DNA to the gel, I just told you it was a DNA sample. But now you know that what we are examining is billions of copies of just part of the RSPO2 gene that were generated using PCR. Earlier, you saw me start the gel electrophoresis. Now I want to tell you how gel electrophoresis works. Gels are close to the consistency of firm jello, but instead of being made with gelatin, they're made with agarose, which is extracted from seaweed. While gels look smooth from the outside, if we look at the gel using a high power microscope, we can see that the inside is a web with holes or pores of many different sizes. The pores in the gel are important because they allow scientists to separate DNA based on length. We can use a schematic animation to better visualize how this works. DNA has a negative charge, so we can apply an electric field to the gel to pull the DNA towards the positive pole. As the DNA travels through the gel, smaller pieces of DNA move more easily and quickly through the pores, so over the same time course, smaller pieces of DNA will travel farther than longer pieces of DNA. A gel contains indentations called wells where you load your DNA sample. You saw me putting the DNA into the wells that I think I called pockets or indentations at the start of the webinar. Once an electric field is applied, the DNA is pulled through the gel, again with smaller pieces of DNA migrating faster. A stain is added to the gel to make the DNA visible, and when you look at the results, you see bands, which contain millions of pieces of DNA of the same length that migrated at the same rate through the gel. Gel electrophoresis is a powerful tool because it allows scientists to separate mixtures that contain DNA fragments of different lengths. For example, in this gel, because samples one and two have two bands, I can tell that they contained a mixture of DNA fragments of two sizes, but sample three only has one band, which tells me that it contained DNA that was all the same length. By including a ladder that contains DNA fragments of known lengths, we can estimate the size of the DNA fragments in our samples. Let's focus on the bands in sample one. By comparing to the latter, I can estimate that sample one contained DNA that was around 400 and 150 base pairs in length. Remember that the dominant RSPO2 allele is 167 base pairs longer than the recessive allele. We can resolve this size difference using gel electrophoresis. Let's see what a heterozygous dog would look like on the gel. They have one copy of the larger dominant allele and one copy of the smaller recessive allele, so we would expect to see two DNA bands of different sizes. The larger band corresponds to the dominant allele, while the smaller band corresponds to the recessive allele. The size of the two DNA bands depends on how the PCR was designed, which is not really that important. What is important is that we can see that the dominant allele is approximately 170 base pairs larger than the recessive allele DNA, which is what we were expecting. If we look at a dog with two copies of the recessive allele, all of their RSPO2 DNA will be the same length, and we see that reflected in the gel where there is a single band of the smaller size. And finally, a dog with two copies of the dominant allele will have a single band of the larger size. So let's take a look at our gel. It hasn't been running that long, but I'm pretty sure we'll be able to see results. I'm gonna switch to my lab cam and then 
hit this light bulb button to turn on the illumination in the blue gel electric freeze apparatus that I'm using. I really like using the blue gel because you can watch your DNA samples migrate in real time. And even though it's super bright in here because it's very, very sunny, I can already see the DNA bands. We'd be able to see it better if I made it dark in the room, but I'm not going to bother. So you can see the bands running along here. So even like a 15 minute run is going to be long enough for us to resolve the differences. I've taken a photo of a gel that I ran a little bit earlier when I took the photo in the dark, so you'll be able to see it better. Let's come back. So let's interpret our results. Here I have a photo of a gel that I ran earlier, like I mentioned. We're going to do something a little weird and start with the second dog, Buster. We can see that Buster has a large band and a small band, which tells us that he's heterozygous for the RSPO2 gene. Now we'll backtrack and look at Astro's DNA. We can compare Astro's results with Buster's to see that Astro only has the larger DNA band, which tells us that all of his DNA was the larger dominant allele and his genotype is homozygous dominant. Chewy has two bands, so Chewy's genotype is heterozygous. The same thing with Daisy, two bands, that tells us that she's heterozygous. Looking at Elsa's DNA sample, she only has the larger band, so her RSPO2 genotype is homozygous dominant. Flora has two bands, so she's heterozygous. On to Ginger. Ginger only has the smaller DNA band, which means she's homozygous recessive for RSPO2. And finally, Hugo. Hugo only has the larger DNA band, so he is homozygous dominant. We can also use each puppy's RSPO2 genotype to predict whether they will have furnishings once their fur has a chance to grow longer. Because having furnishings is dominant, any of the puppies with one or two copies of the dominant allele should grow furnishings, which is all of the puppies except Ginger. With two copies of the recessive RSPO2 allele, we predict that Ginger will not have furnishings. To make sense of what these results mean in terms of who the puppy's father is, let's look back at the Punnett squares we already filled in for Molly and Zeus's puppies versus Molly and Otto's puppies. Remember, we already realized that a dead giveaway is that if any of the puppies is homozygous for the recessive allele, we can know for sure that Zeus cannot be the father. This is because for the puppy to have two copies of the recessive allele, they need to have inherited one copy from each parent, but Zeus only has the dominant allele, so he can't be Ginger's father. Because remember, Ginger is homozygous recessive. This means that we know for sure that Otto is the father of Molly's puppies. But remember, pun and squares are only predictions. They tell you what genotypic ratios you can expect based on probability. We predicted that, in, that any puppies born to Molly and Otto would have the following genotypic ratios. One homozygous dominant to two heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. What did we actually see in Molly and Otto's puppies? Three homozygous dominant to four heterozygous to one homozygous recessive. It's not a perfect match with the prediction because the prediction is just that. It's a prediction based on probability. To summarize, I love this lab because I love dogs. But aside from that, it really does have a lot going for it. While the story might seem a little silly, the lab gives students hands-on experience with modern molecular biology techniques. The curriculum that accompanies the lab could work for many levels. Today we took a really introductory approach and focused on the relationship between RSPO2 genotype and furnishings phenotype. But the lab also has more challenging questions where students consider the inheritance of two genes that both affect a dog's coat, as well as pedigree analysis questions.
I encourage you to sign up for the mini PCR mailing list so you can get a notification when the lab is available this spring. I'll share a link to do that on the last slide of the presentation, so hold tight. First, I just want to answer a few of the questions that were submitted before the webinar. A lot of people ask questions related to specific genetic diseases that are prevalent in certain breeds. An example of this is hereditary deafness in Dalmatians. I want to be clear, I have nothing against Dalmatians. I had a Dalmatian growing up and I'm very fond of the breed. But it's a fact that hereditary deafness is very common for these dogs. The most basic answer to this question is that purebred dog breeds were commonly established through inbreeding, which can increase the prevalence of both desirable and undesirable traits in a population. Selective breeding for desired traits, often related to a dog's physical appearance, led to the establishment of populations of dogs that had a characteristic look. But to achieve this, closely related dogs were often mated. Imagine that one dog has the perfect appearance, so he was used extensively for breeding. But what if that dog also had a mutation that led to a genetic disease? The dog could even be a carrier for a recessive disease, but half of his offspring would inherit that mutation. Down the line, as his offspring were bred, this trait would increase in the population. Let's take a look at a fictional pedigree to see this visually. We'll assume we're starting with some male dog that exemplifies what breeders want in terms of his appearance. But what the breeders don't know is that the dog is a carrier for some recessive disease. Most dog breeds were established centuries ago, like 200 years, and this was before we knew very much about inheritance. This male will be bred since human populations want more dogs with his desired traits. But also, that means he can pass down his recessive allele to his offspring. But this dog is a star, so he gets bred to many females, leading to even more puppies with his good looks, but who could also carry that recessive allele. Then, because there aren't many of these dogs, individuals that are closely related to each other could be bred. And this is when we start to get some individuals who are homozygous recessive and actually have a disease. If it's obvious that those dogs have a disease from an early age, maybe they aren't used for breeding. But even so, there are still more and more carriers of this disease in the population. On to the next question. I was delighted to see that several people asked if a litter, a litter of puppies can have more than one sire. And the answer is yes. For dogs to have multiple puppies at the same time, the female releases multiple eggs. Each egg is then fertilized by one sperm, but if there are sperm from multiple males present, then a litter of puppies could have multiple sires. In fact, this is one of the reasons that paternity testing is sometimes performed in purebred dogs. If you want to know more about the research that led to the discovery that the RSPO2 gene controls furnishings, you can check out this paper. It is a really cool study where the scientists show that variation in just three genes controls coat phenotypes in many dog breeds. In addition to furnishings, they also studied whether dogs have short or long fur and whether their fur is curly or straight. It's a beautiful paper. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you are as excited as I am about the release of the Mini-PCR Dog Genetics Lab. You can sign up for our mailing list to be notified when this lab is officially, be, uh, officially released. You can go to minipcr.com newsletter, or you can scan this QR code to take you there.